Hello and welcome to the Think Big series 2021, brought to you by PSG. My name is Abigail Monsami, and I'm the Manager of Public Policy and Regulatory Affairs at PSG Consult. For those of you who may not know, PSG is a leading financial services group with an extensive national footprint in South Africa and a presence in Namibia. We have been in operation since 1998 and we pride ourselves on providing a bigger picture approach to our clients' financial needs. Whether it's asset and wealth management or short-term insurance that you need, we offer you access to a wide range of insurance and investment products based on solid advice. Our clients benefit from access to registered products and solutions, as well as a comprehensive list of third-party products. So you may have heard about the PSG Think Big series. It's a series of dialogues with leading speakers hosted by the award-winning financial journalist, Bruce Whitfield. Bruce, of course, needs no introduction. The main objective of this series is to bring you independent insights so that you can formulate your own opinion and views on some of our country's most pressing and topical issues. Unfortunately, uncertainty and challenges continue to abound, but not just in South Africa, globally. If we are armed with knowledge, we will be better equipped to chart the way forward. In today's webinar, Bruce talks to Tim Modise. Tim is a veteran journalist, broadcaster, public speaker, and philanthropist, and boasts over 30 years in broadcast media and journalism. He has worked for various radio and TV stations of the SABC, Mnet, Prime Media, BBC, and Power FM across different formats from music, current affairs, and talk shows. He's well known to Business Day audiences, where he currently hosts his own current affairs show called Political Currency. To add to his accolades, he was inducted in the Radio Hall of Fame in 2011. Clearly, against such a list of accolades and years of experience, today's topic is aptly titled The Future of South African Prosperity and the Trends that Will Determine Our Success. Today, Tom will bring a fresh view to the budget speech against the backdrop of unemployment and prolonged uncertainty. The golden question, can business and government work together to set South Africa on the road to success, despite the many challenges that we face. We have a list of upcoming and exciting topics, and our social media campaign is hashtag ThinkBigPSG. Best of all, the series is free, it's shareable, and it's open to absolutely anyone. No need to be a PSG client. And now I'd like to hand you over to Bruce. Abigail, thank you very much. But Tim Mordisa, it's been a long time. It's good to see you. Tell me, how are you feeling about the, the state of the nation? Bruce, thanks very much, my friend, and also for having me as part of the series. I appreciate that. Um, I am not that positive, optimistic as many people would like to be, and I suppose the feeling is shared by many South Africans. Besides the budget, besides uh, what the president said, but it's also the collective experience, you know, that we've had with the restrictions, the lockdowns and the fear of the spread of COVID, the, the loss of loved ones. I suppose something that has happened around the world, but what is a bit um, demoralized or discouraging in the South African context is that we had a major economic contraction, as we know, this, this past year. And it looks like the way we are trying to rebound, we're going to be much slower than other economies around the world. And, and you know, it would have been better if we were rebounding to the same level as at least 2019. But we're going to do what? Recover only half or less than half of what we've lost 
already last year. So you know these things, you spend time talking about them. So it's unfortunate that that's, that's how it looks like. So, you know. It's frustrating, it's worse. We, yeah, it is. we were, as a country, we were doing really, really well. We overcame the economic strictures of apartheid. Uh, mm. Mandela, Mbeki, um, Mbweni, Emmanuel, um, all of the M's came in. Uh, 1994, expanded the South African economy. That continued unbroken until 2008. We have the global financial crisis. And ever since then, we have bumbled and stumbled. Other than the, 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 the World Cup tick up in 2010, we've gone at virtually zero for all of those years. And then, of course, a contraction three times worse in 2020 than there was in 2009. And so much of it, and this is what's so infuriating, is completely self-inflicted. Nobody else did this to us. We did this to ourselves. Yes, as the Minister Pravin Gordon used to like to say that we're scoring own goals, we should stop scoring own goals. And he, he's been saying this from what, 2013, 14, 15, 16, but we continue along the same path. You know, recently, Bruce, I was thinking about the mood in the country in the lead up to 2010, the World Cup. You know, that firstly, we made several attempts to host the Olympics. Remember that? And then we lost to Greece. And then we made another attempt to host the World Cup, lost once. And then the second time we got a chance. I think that was the sort of mood and spirit of the times that we were bullish, you know, very confident that we can handle these things. And then that we want to showcase ourselves to the world and 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 that we could afford to a large extent hosting events of that magnitude i doubt today that if you put it out there to south africans and said let's host one big event of that nature that they would agree with you they'd say you must be out of your mind so i i suppose i, I mean away from the numbers and the, the the economy if you if you look at just that that mood and say what is it that has made South Africans lose that confidence? And as individuals, we can all ask ourselves that question that then we were confident that we should go for it. Now, not many people would agree that we host such an event. So, you know, things have not really worked out well for us. I love the fact that you talk about national self-confidence. I mean, I noticed it for the first time at the Davos gathering of 2016. It was just three weeks after uh, after Jacob Zuma fired in Tlantlanene and then was forced to reappoint Pravin Gordon. And South Africa just, uh, the South Africa stand in Davos uh, at, at the Kirshen Museum was a complete ghost town. It was a complete disaster zone. Nobody was interested in the South Africa story anymore. It was almost like, go and sort yourselves out. And when you grow up and you want to play in the big leagues again, you're more than welcome, but sort yourselves out first. Don't waste our time with your sob stories. And it was, I think from then, um, we've been licking our wounds and hiding in a corner. That self-confidence evaporated um, around that time. Well, I suppose that's the thing that, that would baffle um, our global friends, for instance, but even South Africans, that we know the potential exists in the country. We've been there before. And, and that, that is why I made the case of the lead up to the World Cup 2010, that it's nothing new. We have dealt with apartheid in the past and then you know, found a way of creating a new system, uh, coming up with a constitution and then building a new system, balancing the books, doing all the right things. So we, we understand all that, the, the, the potential, the human potential is there. And otherwise the natural endowments are there. You know, we've got all the mineral resources, we've got, uh, a beautiful environment. The world is always interested in coming to pay us a visit here, beautiful summers. All of the things are there, even, even what we are discussing this morning. I mean, the amount of money that we have in the retirement funds may not be that much compared to big economies of the world, but by at least uh, emerging market standards, we're not doing that badly. And the amount of money that is being invested on the stock exchange, even though the number of companies are reducing there, still substantial. You know, if you took all of these and we regarded that as assets, I think we should be doing much, much better than we are doing at the moment. What's holding us back? What, to your mind, is got into our head? We've had a worm eat into our brains, into whatever, wherever the confidence bit is in our brains, and has hollowed out a gap. 
Mm. I suppose um, it's as much as we have got the new systems and institutions that we are trying to, I mean, that, that should help us uh, uh, run a fully functioning democracy. It's the, it's the politics that's, that's confusing us. And it's not the politics of competition between different organizations or, or, or politics of competition of different ideologies or political parties. It's competition within the main party, uh, the African National Congress. And it is that you, you referenced 2008 in terms of the financial meltdown. But prior to that, just was it a year before that, the internal fighting that led to the dismissal of uh, President uh, Tabombeki at the time. And, and those types of fights have been continuing from then until now. So as long as the focus of the main party, the ruling party is on itself and other practices that have emerged within the organization, then the interest of those who are tasked with running the country will not be addressed anytime soon because they spend more time, unfortunately, whether I say it or I don't say it, that's the reality of the thing. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, most time is spent discussing the interests of the different individuals and factions within the ANC. So by the time we get to unemployment and economic growth and so on, the meeting is over. Maybe there's no money left to us, you know, one last item on the agenda, maybe given an hour of discussion when uh, dozens and dozens of hours would have been spent discussing the internal uh, uh, battles and interests of individuals and factions. So I think I think that's the most debilitating thing in the system so far. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, our, let's talk about our politics because I think I mean, as much as I've always tried to ignore politics as as something irrelevant, it has become so big and so dominant and so domineering that it's actually become destructive. For a long time, you could ignore the politics in South Africa and growth was happening and we had the luxury of being able to ignore the politics. You can't, can you, ignore the politics anymore? You have to become a lot more actively engaged in it as a South African. Absolutely, because uh, firstly, uh, the government is a major player in our economy, as we know, and uh, the fact that the state has got interests in what, about 700 state-owned entities, even though we talk mostly about seven or 10 of them, uh, there are 700 of, of these entities. And during the time that you have referenced, they have all been run the wrong way around, as we know, up to this point. And that's why we have the Zondo Commission, for instance. So imagine the amount of, we can all imagine, the amount of money that's, and opportunities that have been lost, let's say at SAA, the problems at ESCOM, and the impact that these have on how the economy functions. We live in the digital age. We're still having debates about uh, the spectrum allocation, something that should have happened well, how many years ago? Five, 10 years ago? Um, talking about digital broadcasting and data costs having to come down. All of these things have a, a knock-on effect. And of course, with the experience of COVID-19, where we now work and have to interact virtually like we are doing here. The, these things still depend on the support of uh, a reliable energy supply, for instance, the access that people should have to data. If you don't have those two, then you don't have the virtual world that we're supposed to be living in now. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a risky business on an ongoing basis. Yet the South African voter has repeatedly returned the ANC to office. Brand ANC, while it has seen its dominance whittled away, I mean, it went from Mandela to Mbeki, and since then we've seen its dominance fade to, what, 55%, I think, majority at the most recent national elections. South African voters keep returning the ANC to power. Uh, now, Muletsi Mbeki says that's because the ANC has become a party of the rural poor. Um, I wonder about that, and I wonder what your view is. Um, you promise handouts, you keep promising uh, to, to give people social grants, and you keep delivering those, and as long as you can manage that, you stay in power as the ANC in South Africa. That's a, a very broad and weak summary of everything he said, but it's, the, it, it's an outline. Yeah, I suppose that's the 
that is the, the, the case at the moment, but it's also got to do with the fact that um, so when we talk different ideas, political ideas in South Africa, we use only two. One is pre-94 apartheid, and then post-94 democracy. So the shorthand, I suppose, that many people use to analyze what's going on politically is to say, okay, ANC means democracy. Any other thing that especially the parties that came or that were there before 1994 are apartheid parties. So to, to change people's views is going to take some time, but I think the uh, experience now, the economic experience, social economic experience is having um, major influence on the politics now. It's no longer just a case of how do you feel or how do you think about things? It's a case of what are you experiencing at the moment? And of course, time is another factor. Um, we have been living in a democratic South Africa for what? It's going to our 21 uh, years now of the no longer 27 than that. years. Of 27, yeah. yeah. 20, 27 a years, yeah. A long so, time. So, you know, exactly. So many young people who probably have gone to university, graduated, and uh, battling to find jobs were not raised, uh, did not grow up during apartheid days. So they don't really have a direct reference of what it meant to live under apartheid. Like I, I would have a, a different view and experience and I know what the story is and the difference of that era to now. So, you know, with freedom that is brought about by democracy, I think people have expectations. You know, the opening up of society has globalized us. The world has been globalizing anyway. So I, I put myself in the shoes of a young person and, and, it, and, it, and think to myself, what does a 23, 24 year old expect from a democratic society such as South Africa? And this is somebody who has access to DSTV and therefore can compare him or herself to someone in Australia, to someone in China, to someone in uh, North America, to someone in Europe, and even parts of the continent for that matter. And they say, but why can't I be like those people? And of course, we know what happens. You know, when, you, when people, um, uh, their, their dreams are deferred and their potential is not realized, they get, they get frustrated. And in due time, um, they, they will take different decisions to those that were taken by their forebears. How strong is our democracy then? I ask this and it's a loaded question simply because one looks at the political spectrum in South Africa, one looks at the options open to those young people um, and they've got an ANC which their parents may have supported and they may not support. Um, you've got a democratic alliance which can't decide whether it's chalk or cheese. Um, you've got uh, an EFF that is mired in constant controversy. And you hear the volume being turned up every time there's going to be a big um, expose on corruption within its ranks or um, outside of its ranks, but involving members of the party, senior members of the party. And for young people in South Africa today, they're going to be looking at this political, political spectrum and saying that they're dinosaurs, they're people I can't relate to, and they're people I simply can't trust. Where on earth do I put my vote? Uh, and you talk to some of the, the wiser political analysts and they'll say to you, oh, no, this sort of all works out in the end. But my goodness gracious me. I mean, there are glaciers that move faster than South Africa's political process. Well, I suppose we go back to the earlier story, the earlier comment about the internal battles of the ANC. That, you know, in a, in a way, they are the, those are the battles that are going to determine the direction that South Africa takes. As much as I earlier said that it's, it seems personal and factional, uh, it, I think in, in due time it's going to, in fact, it attempts to coalesce around certain ideas. You know, we hear of radical economic transformation, for instance, that there's a group that's fighting for that. And then there's going to be a group that we assume, it hasn't really stated what its mission is, that wants to have a stable uh, country, a, a growing economy, as well as um, as best as possible a corrupt free South Africa. So there are tentative efforts to define, uh, so to speak, the future of the country politically. And, and that is happening within the ANC. So I think the, the major conflict or tensions that will come to a head within the ANC to a large extent will 
will give direction to what kind of country we end up with. And the alliances may form along those lines. So you will find that, um, as we've he heard now, that you know there's, there's an idea being entertained within uh, DA circles to go along with uh, a group that is led by President Cyril Ramaphosa within the ANC. I would say that there are you know smaller parties that would entertain that type of thing. So we may see a fragmentation, but that comes together around the bigger ideas, whether they are good or bad, uh, that emerge from the ANC in due time. How significant are the legal problems that many people in, let's call them the Tea Party, for want of a better word? <laughs> I mean, if you've been to, have you been to, uh, in Kansas for tea? Because I mean, I just that may just change the course of this discussion. But if you've taken a helicopter to to Gaza recently, or a four by four with an armed escort, um, then you're part of a grouping um, that is, you know, a, this alleged radical economic transformation grouping, the ACE grouping, the DD grouping. I don't know who's in the grouping, but it's a it's a motley crew of individuals who, in a court of law, might have some trouble often explaining some of the decisions they've taken in recent years. Um, we've got that lot, uh, and we've got then the so-called Ramaphosa faction. Explain the legal mm. troubles, as you see them, of the Tea Party. Well, that's something that, you know, I think the, 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 the Zondo Commission has uh, given South Africans a front row seat of what has been going on within the state, because uh, many people took long to understand that there were problems uh, within the system and there was a rot in other parts of the state. Now they can hear for themselves firsthand and they hear reports on a daily basis. And I know a lot of people are getting exhausted, fatigued by all of this and in the process demoralized. But one thing for sure is that they know that there are problems where previously those problems could be denied. Now they are there, they are known. So coming to the point of the legal problems of, uh, of the individuals uh, or groups of people concerned, I think since the, 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 they don't, the courts don't sit on the same day for the same peoples, they come, every, every one of the, some of the individuals, high profile individuals have got their own court, court dates and, and they don't fall on the same day or the same month. So in time, even if people can go and uh, gather outside the courts uh, offering support to an individual, in time, they, they tend to um, stay away from, from such things. And then the individuals are left on their own to sort out their own problems. So I think um, uh, these are going to be individuals' problems, ultimately. Um, and, and they increasingly are becoming that so that it will not be possible to organize around court appearances, to organize big rallies around court appearances. Firstly, people will not be able to afford it. And thirdly, I mean, secondly, people will not have the time for that. And uh, thirdly, this year we have local government elections coming up and people are paying more attention to their immediate interests. For instance, um, the high unemployment numbers that have been referred to earlier on, count for something. The relief that was offered to the unemployed people is going to come to an end now, end of what, March, April. Yeah. So, you know, everybody is going to be looking after the, their own interests and say, what about me? What about me? You know, I'm talking about ordinary citizens and that's what's going to inform their way of thinking. And, and maybe, I mean, it's, it's a terribly painful way of going through, but I've been to the Eastern Cape recently and you just look at crumbling infrastructure um, and it's not just visible on, you know, roads and things. It's, you know, people have run out of water. You go to Makanda and people have run out of water. There are, yeah. the, oh, turn the tap, it's day zero in Makanda. Um, mm. And the municipality is just incapable of sorting it out. Um, it's, a, it's an education town. So the schools and universities have gone, you know, all independent on sourcing their own water. But the poor people in Khini and other parts uh, are, are unable to get water. You've got to... Uh, the small coastal towns between, uh, uh, you know, in, East, in the Eastern Cape, and you just see um, these towns are getting abandoned because people have run out of water. Simple stuff. And that's why these local government elections are finally going to give South Africans an opportunity to have a real vote and have a real say in the future. And I think I'm looking so looking forward to seeing how we vote to see how seriously we treat our own problems. 
Well, I mean, you, you, you use the example of the Eastern Cape. There's, there's an example here in Gauteng of Midval, for instance, yeah. run by the young mayor, Bongani Baloi, and uh, sitting side by side with M. Fuleni. And the experiences of the, uh, according to the residents of the two municipalities, are vastly different. Um, people are saying that Midval is much, much, much better run than M. Fuleni. In the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the bigger Val area where sewage is running in the streets and so on. And, and there are no potholes just across the border in, in uh, mid Val. Whenever problems emerge, they get sorted out pretty quickly. So people can see for themselves and they are talking about these things. And I think um, this is what's going to inform how they vote. And on top of that, the ruling by, uh, was it the constitutional court, I think that said that we must go the route of the direct vote as much as that was possible um, at local government uh, uh, level. But at national level in 2024, people are looking forward to seeing independent candidates emerge. And something that is also of immediate importance that I, I think we need to mention here is the fact that political party funding is going to be made public by law from the end of April 2021. So all how, of these things. How valuable how, is that? I mean, we know that if we are nothing, if we're not experts at anything, we are experts in hiding money. <laughs> um, yes. uh, if the last decade has taught us anything about it, we know where the nooks and crannies are to hide money. I love the fact we have the legislation, but we have reams of legislation. There are data storage centers full of our legislation, tons of laws, and no very little application or implementation. The good thing, Bruce, about South Africa with all its problems is that uh, we do have um, a thriving civil society movement in the, in the country and um, NGOs and even individuals who don't mind to test these things and will take them to court if they have to be for whatever information to be revealed if it has to be. So in as far as that is concerned, if, if uh, parties do not uh, voluntarily disclose information, they will be forced to by various uh, actions before the court. So I, I, and of course the media with, the, with its shortcomings continues to play a substantial role in South Africa. The investigative journalism has unearthed so much information. In fact, if people hide information, that is exactly what is going to breathe life into the news media, investigative journalism. So you hide, then they come after you and then uh, and then uh, people will read up about these stories. And then the next thing, somebody will be taken to court or will be sued for whatever. Yeah, no, look, I mean, it's a, the only problem is it's so exhausting. But talk to me about public-private partnerships because there's a lot spoken about public-private partnerships from within government and from outside government. You've got people in business saying, we'd love to work more with government um, and we would love to collaborate more. We would love to see everybody succeed and we're in for there's still a massive trust deficit, even though people work very well together during COVID and we saw um, the creation of the Solidarity Fund and um, it, it's done a huge amount of really good work and there's been great collaboration. One gets the sense that it's sort of only done when everybody's in real trouble. Um, and I'm not too sure that that's necessarily the basis from which to build a new social compact. Well, there are a few things um, that I think uh, are going to compel, if you will, if uh, the major players are reluctant to work together or believe that uh, we've got time on our side. There are a few things that are going to make um, the public-private partnerships work and be implemented, especially between the big players. And they are in the area of the first one is energy. Okay, you can kick the can down the road for as long as you want, but the demand and the problem uh, of the stable, reliable energy supply will make sure or will compel the players to come up with another way, another form, another means of generating electricity. And we, we can see with the talk of the uh, IPPs now going on there, right? And we can see with the municipalities like Stellenbosch municipality saying that they want to generate their own power. So that, that's, that's one area. The other area where I think we're going to see this happen much faster than we, we can anticipate is in the area of, of water supply. 
um, that it's not stable. You've spoken about parts of the Eastern Cape where there's no water due to a variety of things. Now, private organizations are going to come in there and start providing some of those services. The gift of the givers are doing it anyway, whether we call it uh, public-private partnership, but they already have intervened in that. So we can't wait. Certain things will just force us to go ahead and, and have these uh, public-private partnerships uh, come into play. Another area is that of um, commuter transport, the railway system. Um, I think the fact that you know even, even bus companies had to shut down and that we don't have a properly functioning commuter railway system, and we used to have, may, yeah. and, and we could have done more with that, I believe, uh, because it was one of you know very most reliable modes of transport in the country. It's almost collapsed now, and uh, it has to be restarted one way or another. I, I foresee a scenario where the local um, commuter system is outsourced to certain players, and maybe only the major lines are operated by by, by, by the national government. So the three immediate areas where I see public-private partnerships having to work, whether we think they are the right way or not the right way, but out of necessity, they'll have to happen, is energy, is water, and it's transport. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, when it comes, but it, uh, the trouble is where things seem to have to break first before we then try to address the Unfortunately. Picture. Can we yeah. be more proactive? I mean, surely we can be more collaborative and collaborative, collaborative, there is, there's the word, um, and yeah. a little bit more proactive in finding resolution. But it, it goes back then to the complexity of the relationships within the ANC. And the moment government winks at the, the private sector, it's accused of being anti-transformational, it's being anti-developmental states, or it's accused of getting into bed with capitalists. And, it's damned if it doesn't, it's damned if it doesn't. Yes, but interestingly again, is that um, the mining companies, as an example, are playing a major role in the communities uh, in which they operate, right? Where services have collapsed. They've had to intervene, some of the mining companies to, um, to help, to assist the local municipalities because of lack of the same water supply that I've mentioned, uh, provision of even healthcare in some instances, and even education for that matter. And with this uh, expanded is a district model, I think it's called, the bigger companies are actually being invited to play an even more increasing role. By the way, uh, in the agricultural sector, apparently some agro-processing companies uh, operating in the more rural parts of South Africa have taken on the task of providing some local services. So, you know, these things are happening anyway, whilst people are bickering at the top or elsewhere. But out of human need and uh, uh, resolution of problems, people are going ahead and forming those partnerships. It doesn't make you a winning country, though. I mean, having a dysfunctional government and completely broken local government doesn't build a winning nation, doesn't restore that sense of confidence we started out talking about. It doesn't make us feel like we can be really, truly global citizens who can be hold our heads up high and say, you know what, we're, we sort of say, yeah, we're surviving. Whoops, big pardon. <laughs> we're surviving, we're surviving. Yeah. Um, but nobody is interested in survivors. People want winners. How do we become winners? Good question, and a bit complicated, but let's see. Let's think together and see what, what happens here. At the end of the day, um, I think when ordinary South Africans realize that whatever is going on in the country is as a result of the choices that we make, at that time, that is when uh, things will either improve or collapse completely. I think um, to a large extent, people have outsourced the thinking, uh, the participation in the system to those who are in charge and uh, people have been bystanders and uh, many people are beginning to learn that when you are not involved and you are on the sidelines, this is what will happen to your interests as a community or as individuals. 
So on the basis of that, uh, when people wake up to the fact that they need things to happen dif differently, then we'll see a change. An example has already happened, by the way, I, 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 with fees must fall campaign. You know, that within a short period of time, of time, the students decided, the university students, that they wanted their fees to be scrapped and uh, that they needed to be provided with free university education. And, and what happened? Ultimately, they, they did force uh, that decision on the part of the government to provide free university education. So we're likely to go along that path path and um, again it's up to the individual citizens but it doesn't happen strategically and there's the problem i mean yes jacob zuma as his farewell gift to south africa said here's another 100 billion rand for you to find cheers suckers and gave a hospital pass to to his successors and said okay i've created the problem of of funding this thing now you mm. go and find the money um and it's all well and good and noble and lovely and you know we want great universities that are well-funded and students can get the best access to education possible, but somehow the money has to be found. And you only find that money in a thriving, growing economy, which we don't have. So how do we get to a state where you and I say, you know what, let's open up a factory. Let's open up a shop. Let's open up any kind of enterprise that's going to create 10, 20, 30 jobs. Let's Let's all commit our capital to physical development in South Africa, to a, call it a developmental state, if you like, one in which we can make a return um, that rewards us for the risk we're prepared to take. Because right now, so many people are so busy, the moment they get 50 cents in their bank account, figuring out how many US cents they can get for that and trying to offshore it almost immediately because they're petrified of the future. We need to try and create some sort of sense of future. And I'm not too sure that that's being done very effectively. There's a lot of good work happening, but I'm not too sure that we're looking far enough ahead beyond development plans and other fluff um, that we're fed on a regular basis by politicians. Well, the good thing is we can always look at what has happened elsewhere in the world, right? That certain major decisions that nations have to make can be imposed on them if they don't proactively take those decisions. And we've seen what happened with the, the Soviet Union, uh, communism in 18, I mean, 1989, 1990, and the knock-on effect of that elsewhere in the world. And it's been a messy affair for some of the countries, but they've had to deal with, 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 with whatever emerging problems. Um, in the case of Rwanda, they went through a very painful genocidal war, which cost a lot of lives. And again, they ended up with the system that they ended up with and uh, to the best of their ability with whatever questions that may be raised about the Paul Kagame government. Um, they are trying and they, they've, they, they seem to be rebuilding their country. And uh, in the main, a lot of uh, Rwandans seem to be happy with what is going on there. And uh, they are and Tito, Boweni, Tito Boweni, I mean, if you said to him, Tito, you're going to be banished into exile in Rwanda, he'd be the happiest guy. I mean, he'd miss He'd miss Limpopo, of course he would, but I mean, it's his favorite country in Africa. I mean, he just, he, he thinks the, the Rwandans are doing a brilliant job. Yeah, and I, I, you know, and on the back of that, I think we can learn from such experiences that we may probably go through the same, even China for that matter. I mean, the Communist Ch Party of China ran during the time of Mao Zedong, we know the country was run, was run to the ground. And then in time, they realized that they go in the wrong direction, change direction, and uh, planned ahead and, and did things differently. And we talk as if it's a completely new government in China, but it's the same government that's been there. It's just that it changed the way it sees the world and the way they, they want to run the affairs of, of their people. So I'm hopeful that in South Africa, we probably will go that route. And uh, here's the interesting thing, again, in South Africa. That you know that the, the fact that we live in different provinces, right? Um, somehow counts to different people. If you if you if, if, if you gave each one of us a certain amount of money, and said, with this money you decide which province you want to live in, that will give you a sense of what people want to see happen. Uh, and and not only that, but they also vote 
with their feet. I mean, they move around. You mentioned the Eastern Cape. The question that must be asked is, why do people prefer to go and even if they may, uh, you know, maintain their roots in the Eastern Cape, but go and work in the in the Western Cape? Or why is 25% of the country's population living in Houting, which is only 1% of the geographical mass of land in South Africa, 25% were, con were concentrated here. So that, to my mind, that, that gives you a sense of, of what people want. Obviously, the ideal is who and when are the decisions or choices going to be made that can propel the country forward? Because if we don't make smart decisions and better decisions as individuals and as collectives and as groupings and as trade unions, yeah. and businesses, whatever it might be, do we inevitably go down the path? I mean, because you're suggesting all these wonderful turnaround stories you suggest only happen after massive dislocation, death, mayhem yeah. and destruction. Can we, 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 1994 happened without that and it worked for a while and we've dislocated again and need to fix it again. Can we fix it without big trouble? I think we must give ourselves credit sometimes as well, <laughs> notwithstanding the troubles and what may appear like a lot of nonsense going on in our nation. Within that short period of time, um, for the right or the wrong reasons, we've had two presidents fired in South Africa and life went on anyway. Okay, <laughs> so as, young, as much as we're a young democracy, but we've already tested certain things. Um, we may, may not have been the ones who took the decision for those things to happen, for President Baker to be dismissed or, or President Zuma to be dismissed, but it has happened. And then we are still here. We're talking about uh, elections going to be held, local government elections. We're still talking about different political parties. And nothing collapsed in that, in that way. So I would think that the political animals and players should pay attention, the political players should pay attention to that way of things working in South Africa sometimes. That it can be that uh, ordinary citizens fire a president or fire a government, you know, besides the, 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 the procedural way of voting and so on, that something else might happen prior to that. Uh, we haven't we haven't reached that point where government is forced out and and uh, a new government is put in in place to take those decisions that you that you mentioned and that many people would like to see being taken. Give me, I don't know, a perspective. Dare you look into? Dare you look ten years ahead and say South Africa twenty thirty? What does it look like? Um. Very difficult. Uh, if, um, if one is using the tool, the, the situation that we see now, and the thinking that is being uh, spoken about out there, it looks like we are in a holding position. But until when, I've got no idea. But having said that, the pressures that are going to come from the high unemployment rate um, will force something in this in this country. I'm I'm personally concerned about the fact that the substantial majority of the unemployed people are, are young South Africans who have not really realized their dreams. And, and, and as they grow older, they, they would like to be active participants in the economy. So if you will, you could say that we have an economic apartheid in South Africa, and, and that is a major threat to the political democracy. Because on one hand, you participate in a, in a democratic system politically, but when it comes to the economics of it, you do not participate. Therefore, you are marginalized. And therefore, you may not respect uh, nor recognize whatever the system is all about if you are not deriving any benefit from it. So I think the tension between, between the sustainability of the political system and the opportunities for the people is what is going to determine what we end up with in South Africa. But I'm banking, on the other hand, on the uh, potential that I know we have in South Africa. It's there, the resources that are there. Uh, it's just a case of the right decisions being taken. And, uh, and, and the nation, to a large extent, is also a talking nation. You know, people talk about these things. 
uh, and they offer their own ideas of, of what should happen going forward. It's also interesting. I mean, we are also, I think, discount the progress that has been made because the, the political progress that has been made, the, the legal process that has been made, the transformation, internal ANC transformation that has happened, the government transformation that has happened in the last three years, and it has been three years since Ramaphosa um, was at the front of firing Jacob Zuma, has been quite extraordinary. Um, in, in many respects, I mean, stopping the rot is like trying to stop a 10 ton truck running, coming straight at you on a highway. It, it hurts. You're going to get crushed. You're going to get damaged before mm. the, the, thing, the thing stops. And only once it stops can you then you know, change the tires and, and move on a bit. I'm, you know, it's frustrating as anything for all of us. But at the same time, we've got to, I think, accept the magnitude uh, of what is being done here. Yeah, actually. You know, to go back to the question of what might happen 10 years down the line, mm. either the system that we have is maintained and sustained, and in order for that to happen, more opportunities must be created. Alternatively, people may lose confidence in the system completely and say, it's the system that has failed us, let's do away with it. And then maybe bring about an authoritarian type regime, it's possible. Um, and these things happen, you know, in um, even in the, the best of times in the best countries in the world, you know, you can see the rise of extremism and what kind of extremism that one would be thinking about, I don't know, but I can imagine that it could be a sort of a, a, a big man type uh, government where people say we want law and order and then the person comes in with law and order and says promises to make fundamental changes to the African, I mean the South African system and uh, take benefits to the people, create uh, uh, public all, works it, programs that employ a lot of it, people. It all depends on which kind of big man we talk about, big person, big person, big person we're talking big about. Big person, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, but usually it's men who do stupid things, so it's likely to be a big man. Um, yeah. I, I put it to you slightly differently, Tim, and I said to you, what, just what if we do get greater public-private partnerships? We do get a different degree of political collaboration, as John Steenhuisen suggested recently, and the ANC actually goes, you know what, it's worth splitting. We actually, you know, you, when you... When you but a terrible illness, you need to cut out the, the, the cause of that illness. Let's do that. Let's have collaboration. Let's work together a little bit better. Let us try to improve the livelihoods of South Africans. I mean, I don't know if that's Pollyanna pipe dream stuff, but I'd like to think it is possible. Well, I mean, there's, there's something that's going on. Actually, uh, the matter of uh, former President Jacob Zuma and the Zondo Commission. It's very instructive, actually. Um, we may expect it to be sorted out within days or weeks, but I th I think of it as testing the system yeah. to see whether it works or not, all right? And not only the system as in the constitution and the public institutions, but the system as in the ANC itself, how does it manage that, uh, that, that situation? So it's a case of who's going to blink first and what happens? When, when, that, when, when we get to that point of, of who's blinking. For instance, for now, it may appear to those who support the different factional groups or leaders that uh, uh, Jacob, Zuma's, Jacob Zuma is, is, is winning the game at this, at this time. But what happens down the line, a few months down the line, once all the court appearances happen and the decisions get taken, and if there are arrests to be made, arrests are made and, and he's sent to prison because somebody will have to maybe grant him a pardon and who's that person going to be? You see, and, and that is what will define the, the power structures in, in the current form. But the 10 year question and, and vision that you're asking about is very, very important. One can only hope and trust that uh, the current president and the government are thinking along the same lines of what happens to South Africa over a five to 10 year period. Uh, but as matters stand, I think more than ever before, South Africans are politically engaged and uh, they more or less have a sense of what they would like to see happen at local level starting this year and even at national level in 2024. And, and, 
and things that may seem not so connected will determine what happens. As long as ESCOM is not working, not many people are going to be happy in this country. That's a, that's a fact. <laughs> and just, was, before, just before we get low, Chet, I think we can call it a day. Tim Odisa, thank you very much indeed All right. for sharing uh, some perspectives and your insights and your views with us today. Abigail, back to you. Thank you, Bruce and Tim. Truly insightful discussion. It seems what we require as a country is to reignite our national self-confidence and become more proactive and make the right decisions at all levels. We need to also continue to nurture and embrace public-private partnerships beyond pandemic time. In closing, a reminder that a skilled and trusted financial advisor can be invaluable during these uncertain times. They can provide objective insights and help you consider alternative scenarios so that you can make considered rational decisions on your wealth and insurance portfolios. If you, if you do have an advisor, I encourage you to engage with them. And if you don't, then please get in touch with us. As always, we welcome your feedback. So please communicate with us. And be sure to register for our next exciting speaker in the Think Big series. Thank you and goodbye for now.